if it was what? Oh, change your career. Really. Really. Oh. Oh. Well, no, they're like, it's so small. You know, it's in the movie. No. I people here? Uh, is it 6 o'clock? It is 6 o'clock. There is enough people here. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to get started now. Fill out the attendance link if you haven't done so already. So uh, the Cyber Force competition is coming up at the end of November. We have to have a team selected by this Friday. We have, done, we have selected a team. Uh, not all of the team members have gotten back to us yet. I'm um, looking at you, Kyle. Uh, but this is the Cyber Force team. Uh, if any of you six cannot make it, or you don't, not sure if you can make it, come talk to us after the meeting. Um, there probably isn't going to be a lot of stuff coming out until like mid-October, so you got some time to look over the previous ANL docs uh, to sort of get a feel for how the competition works. Uh, in other news, Linux slash networking advanced sessions are going to start next week. Um, uh, it's going to be Thursdays at 6 p.m. I'm planning on doing that. Uh, the location is sort of TBD right now. It's probably going to be uh, either East Hall 105 or uh, Room 1, like down in the basement. Um, I'm going to record these. We might live stream them, possibly, if I can figure out how, to, how all that works. Maybe Cody will teach me. Um, the first topic is going to be Juniper SRX. It's a network firewall. I'm going to walk through securing the, uh, the device itself. Uh, like passwords, uh, hashes, dealing with services and things like that. Basic network configuration, uh, doing like NAT and like uh, like one-to-one -one NATs and bi-directional NATs and all that cool stuff. And firewall configuration. This is all going to be on the command line, no web interfaces at all. Uh, so beware. Um, so yeah, it's going to be at Thursdays at 6. Don't worry if you can't come, we will be recording these. So first, we're going to have Nathan talk about Inject a little bit. Awkward silence. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to go really quick over this. Um, so this weekend, you guys got 10 in. Uh, we had 11 Injects. Um, I think there was an issue with sending out the last one. So didn't get sent out, or there wasn't enough time, whatever. Um, so total, you guys got 10 injects coming out to about uh, 3,900 points. We normalized that to 5,000 um, just to make it even with service scores. So one important thing to remember is injects are worth half your score. You could get zero, which is actually a good score in services uh, if you go off this week uh, weekend, um, and you get half of your injects or even more in point value, you're going to be doing really good. Um, com are commonly in regionals, we win because of injects because we're very good at doing injects. At least our DSU, our, uh, I don't know, our varsity team, we'll call them that, are pretty good at doing injects. So they're very important. Um, some key things to remember in, in going into the next few mocks, especially if you guys are going to be doing team captain or injects, uh, or inject handler, make sure you manage your time. Maybe write them down in a notebook. Do something that works for you to manage deadlines when you receive them. Who has to do them? Who has to, if someone has to go somewhere? Um, maybe if it's a multi-part 
in, uh, inject, make a checklist of what you need to do. Whatever works best for you and the captain, both of you, um, work out what's going to work well. Because um, that's going to set you off pretty well to begin with. So, Next is uh, know your team strengths. So if I'm on a team with Nick and Cutshaw and uh, Dylan, I'm not going to give Cutshaw or Nick a Windows tap, uh, inject. Maybe they have to add a user to the domain. That's not really their strong suit. Dylan would be a much better option for that. So making sure that when you assign injects to people, they, they know what they're doing. Um, if you don't know anybody that knows how to do it, ask. Um, if you need to change a banner on a website, ask. Um, maybe somebody you didn't expect knows how to do it. That'll help a lot instead of someone having to research how to do it. Um, if nobody knows how to do it, uh, try to figure it out yourself if you feel comfortable with that, or talk to your captain about who should you should uh, talk to about that. So. It's a lot of conversation with your captain, too. Um, the next big thing is be professional. Uh, whether you're actually going and talking to the CEO or you're just talking to one of the white teamers that's walking around, be professional. If you're not being professional, we can take points away. It's kind of our administrative rights to your points um, is we can take points away if you're not being professional. So do be professional, be courteous. Don't be mean to white teamers. I know somebody got deducted points for being mean to white teamers this last competition, so. Um, oh yes, reports versus presentation. Um, an important thing to remember, and I think most of you guys did pretty good on this. Um, when you're writing a report, you're writing it as if you're talking most likely to the, to the uh, head of technology, who is somebody who would know what DNS is used, can understand acronyms a little bit better, um, can understand the system a little bit better, um, and you don't have to be as explained like I'm five-ish. You can be way more, a little bit more technical. Obviously, don't jump off the deep end with it, um, but you have a little bit more flexibility there. With presentations where you're going to go talk to a CEO or something like that, basically explain it like they're five. Um, I mean, don't of course, don't insult them or insult their intelligence, um, but don't go way over their head. Um, also, don't give them stuff they don't need to know. Um, if you're going to add uh, an IP to be blocked in a firewall, you do not have to step through, through them. Or you don't have to go through step-by-step -step process for them to do that because they will never touch a firewall. They will tell someone else to go, hey, go block this site, and then the tech department will figure that out. So that's an important thing that I saw quite a few teams do um, is they were just going way to not what the CEO will ever do. So um, other than that. Uh, Keep your presentation, a good idea for presentations is you can put acronyms and systems and stuff like that on there and then explain to them what they do. Like you can say DNS, that's how um, everybody, like when they type in Google, it actually goes to Google instead of having to type in an IP or a DHCP, hands out IPs, stuff like that. Um, you can tell them like in better terms that while having the acronym up there, so don't be afraid to do that. Just make sure you're explaining it right. Um, and try to answer their questions to the best of your ability. Um, we can tell normally when you're bullshitting it just by your attitude and how you're going. Even if we don't know what you're talking about, it's pretty easy to tell when you have no clue what you're talking about. So at least get some basis, um, like content filtering. Uh, if you don't know anything about like a, an actual enterprise level web filter, you can say that they exist, but don't go into too many details because we can tell when you're just starting to think on the spot. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but make sure you're just not lying out of your mouth. But I don't know. Anybody have any questions about Injex? That's really all I have. Yes? I might have used this on Sunday, but does it have to be the same person going up and presenting every time? Uh, no. I would highly recommend your team captain go and present to the CEO for like the um, final wrap up and like the beginning. So like something where you would think like a manager would go and talk about that, it's probably a good idea. Um, with the uh, content filter presentation, if someone who's more skilled in that goes up and talks, it's not that big of a thing. Um, but like with the first and the third one, yes? At Nationals, I was the only one that could go. Yeah, for, uh, so. Unless there was extenuating circumstances. Uh, Usually only the captain can go. Yeah. 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 You can bring someone. There you go. Captains must always go. We'll just go with that. Thank you, Dylan. I've never been to Nationals, so I get everything secondhand from them. Any other questions? 
Seeing none, I will leave the stage. Right, so I'm gonna walk you through basically um, a little bit about passwords um, and password change requests, and then I'm gonna talk for a little bit about how the scoring engine was actually scoring your services. Um, so these are a few passwords that were submitted to the scoring engine. Um, these are too long and complicated. You will have a very, very hard time typing these on your computer. Um, and when you have to slow down and spend 60 seconds typing a password, that's time better spent securing your, your systems. Um, so don't do this. Red Team is not going to throw up an enormous GPU cluster in AWS and burn through all your passwords for like a week. This is a four hour competition in these mocks. Um, they don't have enough time to, to like break hashes um, unless they're really, really simple. So keep it shorter, but not too short. These are too simple. Um, password run bang is the default credentials on all the systems. You should not submit that to the scoring engine. <laughs> um, were these actual passwords that were submitted? These were actual passwords that were submitted to the scoring engine, yes. <laughs> I just want to yes. <laughs> I assume they were trying to fix scoring issues, but yeah. Um, don't do alphanumeric, like don't do really short stuff. That's just numbers. Don't do really sh like stuff you'd find in like a password list. Um, super secret might be good, but that's like pretty easy to do with like uh, concatenation um, in like brute forcing. Um, so don't go super simple like this. These are some decent passwords. That Apple one might not work in like a two day competition where red team might spend the night cracking your passwords, but the other ones are gonna be pretty decent. Um, typically what we do at regionals and nationals is that we do something like that both race horn password um, and then we switch it on day two. So they, if they crack it during the night then they won't be, have the new one. But yeah, these aren't too bad. And if you're going all lowercase, make sure it's long enough basically. Don't leave your passwords lying around on your systems. Um, strength doesn't matter if you're leaving your passwords in your home directory. Um, this happened a little bit at, at the mock. Um, one thing, I know this was a little bit of a change from the mini mock, was that you could use that all keyword to change all the passwords for all the users on the system. Um, in that case, you don't need that line with the echo. Oh, it got covered. Like this line here, you don't need it anymore because you can just have your like uh, whoever's changing your password do the all and then they have the password, they don't need all the user names. Um, that's one thing to worry about there. We probably won't make you type in every single user and password on the scoring engine until like late in spring probably uh, when we get closer to regionals. And with Windows didn't have any sort of password list on their systems, right? Uh, I don't know. That'd probably be some red team would know better. Did you see anything like that? Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. If you were using a script like that, oh, yeah. that's that's probably where people got tripped people up. People would run that script, type it line by line, and then they would leave the CSV on the system, so we could just cat it and have all the passwords for that system, and probably some other passwords. Oh. Yeah. So that's I'm sure that's scary. All right, on scoring, it was pretty simple. Uh, for all the web services, that was your main company website, your HR management website, and your uh, e-commerce site. We basically just took the like the main page, the like index.php basically, on each of those. Um, that's where Red Team got you uh, on the company website, especially, was that they posted like uh, they defaced your website with a post. Uh, yeah, oil is evil. And that's what the scoring engine was checking that that main page hadn't been changed. Um, and then on the file shares, basically we, I just chucked a bunch of random files on there and then I grabbed a few of them off of the file share. Um, basically the way that works is that it grabs the file off, checks the hash that it matches what it expects. Um, on the Windows file share, I made sure that only the user account like they all had like their own personal uh, user directories in that uh, SMB share. And I made sure that that user account matched the folder name. And that was about it. Um, top secret.tar.gz.gpg was not scored. Um, that was uh, intentional. Basically what we wanted you to do there what, during your um, PII security check was to go in there and notice that like this has a bad password on it. I'm gonna change it 
So that's more secure because it was guitar, which is like in your top thousand passwords on everything. Um, on DNS space, we check different A records, basically your main company website, your HRM or shop. We just checked that those DNS records matched. LDAP, we were just checking that we could log in over LDAP. And then RDP was only being logged in by Rachel Slavin. So that was the CEO's machine, only she was logging into it. Um, you might have been able to notice that um, later on uh, when we cover logging, we'll show you how you can look at your RDP logs. And if you see something like this where there's only one or two or three people logging in consistently on a system, you can just lock it down so only those three people can log in. Because if the scoring engine is only checking those things, chances are that's all white team cares about. Then on dev, we were logging in over SSH and then checking that a file existed on the system, which was then user local scripts. Um, that's a little bit hard, trickier to actually check, like uh, to log, um, but we'll get into that later on in the semester as well. <coughs> All right, now, Michael, talk about Linux side configurations. Cody, I should be able to like just unplug and replug, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ideally. The most difficult part of the night is hooking up a Linux laptop. Where we are, I think we're actually duplicated. Isn't that great? Okay. Just basically going to be doing a brief run through on each system and kind of what we did to, did to it and how you could have fixed it. Uh, first one, the R and D box. This um, this was an FTP server, as you can see. I already made sure that the network wasn't broken. Okay. So uh, the scored services was FTP. That was the first thing. So that's the only thing we need to have open. Um, something to note was if you were to check the banner, and there's other ways you could have done this, you would have noticed it's VSFTP 2.3.4. Can anybody tell me what's interesting about that version? There is a backdoor. There is a backdoor. If you log in with a smiley face in your username, it opens up a telnet listener on uh, port 6200. So. Red team at any point can pop a shell and get in on this particular service, but it will give them a shell on a different port. Something to know. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to replace the service, though. Uh, the easy way to fix that is simply to firewall that off. Um, we also had SSH running in this box as well. Uh, I got to remember Debian versus Ubuntu. Can you zoom in the Firefox window? Uh, I don't know if that's possible, Cody. Oh, you're right, I do. Why am I, why am I, oh. Interest, what is it doing that's funny? There we go. It doesn't like it inside the window. Yeah, you know, big Linux terminals versus small Linux terminals. Okay. So the other service running this box is SSH. Keep that in mind. Uh, it's unscored. There's no reason it has to be there. So first thing on this box would have been, let's change the password for root to whatever. Doesn't matter. Then we would have ran our password change script. Then we would have done firewalls, more or less. Um, on your firewalls, which I'll probably do here in a second, but if you wanted to, before you did firewalls, you could have just stopped it using service, which we didn't go over. It's either going to be service or system CTL, slightly different syntax, same idea. You run that. We just killed SSH. So now all we have running is, is FTP. No, it stops. So the service is dead. Okay. Unless you reboot. Okay. Unless you reboot. So the way to, to do that would have been, I don't know if, no, nope, it doesn't, doesn't support it. Okay, dash yeah, it likes that, doesn't it? See, um, Linux has, is that going to work by itself? No, you got to do, isn't it? Uh, it's not defaults, though, is it? SSHD and then SSH. It should just be that. Yeah. 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 And it's going to complain about my VSFTP script being bad because I did it badly. No. Um, that's going to be different. So that's how you do it with init. We have, or sys5 init. We have different init systems. If you guys get one with systemd, it's going to be, and it's going to be stop or disable depending on what you're doing and then the name of the service. Just for future reference, we'll end up going over that later. 
So as said, at this point, we've changed the passwords. Maybe we've disabled SSH. Main issue, FTP, we kind of have that back door there. We, not really any nice way to do that. We could try upgrading the service, which might end up breaking it, might bring it down. Uh, the easiest thing to do with this particular service is just firewall it off quick. So if we throw up a firewall, let's just go through the motions here. I'm gonna leave the, um, the pol I'm not gonna change the policy until last. So let's make sure I don't mistype everything. Okay, we're allowing port 21. We're allowing port 20. Uh, then let's do FTP. So port 21, what's that for? Does anybody know? FTP? I'm hearing FTPs. Does anybody know what port 20 is for? Also FTP, but what's what particular port portion of FTP? Yeah, it's it's the data port. Uh, does anybody understand why I'm opening those particular ports? No guesses. So I didn't mistype everything. I didn't. Okay, those are t to be honest, those ports do exactly nothing right now. Those are the passive data ports, but I haven't figured that out with the SFTP. Uh, um, the reason we implemented those ports was if stuff is natted, we can't access FTP otherwise, the way the, the protocol works. Uh, let's just throw in some other rules here quick. Um, anybody can tell me what this one's for? Or what the general idea is? Yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to run through a couple more quick. So that last one was related established. We use that one for, no, that, that wouldn't have been. No protocol on that one. Yeah. So related established rules. Why do we need, why do we need those? Anybody know? Any guesses? No? Related established rules allow a connection to come in. When we're writing these fire rules, the really only part we're writing for is when the packet's new. When the packet first comes in, that's when we're blocking stuff, that's when we're dealing with it. Once it becomes related established, we really don't care anymore. So let's look at my caps lock, guys. It's a thing. Nope. Nope. Um, that's called staging. That's, that's how you get disqualified. Uh, which is why we let you guys access resources and nationals you'll be given laptops. Uh, now the real question is, after I lost my train of thought, where am I at? Basically, like, basically you just do this 100 times? Like, yeah, you get, you get a lot better. Um, yeah. You get significantly better. Uh, I, think I'm, did you, did you, I think I'm good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now I'm just changing the default policies. I think you screwed up the data port for that. Oh, did I? Yeah. I think it's a source port. Sure about that? Pretty sure. Uh, it's, well, if that's, that's, that's odd because I tested it earlier and it worked. I don't know. To be honest, I'm not being scored as far as I'm aware, right? No. You can't tell whether I'm doing it right or not. Okay. So, um, last thing I did there, people know what that means? What does P do? Default rule, default policy, same thing. If it doesn't match any of the rules in the chain, it hits that and that's what happens. In this case, I changed it from everything's open to everything's dropped. Um, you can do that in either order. The difference is I wrote all the rules out first and then changed the policy so I wouldn't lose points. If I did it in reverse order, I'd be losing points until those rules came into effect. Not a big deal. Um, as a reminder, you can use IP table save. That'll print all the rules. I'll put that to a file. Put it at crc.local. That's how that works. Uh, that's how you get it persistent. Um, I don't know if people messed it up or not. I really wouldn't know. Uh, some stuff Red Team did do. A anybody know what I'm talking about here when I said the .ssh directory? Why is that important? Why is that something that Red Team might want to mess with? What's in there? Keys. Okay, so what Red Team did was, okay, and it's not even here. Um, normally there's gonna be a file called is it authorized keys? It's authorized keys. Uh, there's going to be a file in here called authorized keys. In that file is going to be 
the RSA public key matching a private key. What that lets them do is that any public keys in that file, you can use the matching private key to log into that system. Why that's a problem is it completely bypasses any password authentication whatsoever. Meaning that red team can get in here, they can stick those keys in here, and it doesn't matter how many times you change the password, they're going to use their keys to log in, you're still in trouble. Uh, I'm gonna take a step back because I forgot about it. Didn't finish that up. Okay, some people had issues with this. You, you know those ports I punched in previously, the 65,500 and, and whatever for the passive data ports? Um, to get those to work properly, you guys needed to add two lines into this config file. Uh, this was in the VSFTP checklist, so I don't feel too bad about having that in there. And it's literally that and Six five five zero two. That's it. That would have changed it by default, as far as I'm aware. Uh, anybody know? So, so tell me now. Are those rules going to take effect? Is that configuration change is going to take effect right now? No. If we start the service, I don't know. Some people could probably just reboot the box, and it would probably do the same thing. Uh, yeah. Once again, blank line. Uh, just put this in perspective, I wrote the init scripts for that. That didn't come in there. So I, I wrote the service restart stop. That's why they're terrible. Um, but going back to SSH for a minute with our keys. Okay, still in on host in there. Um, so SSH keys, how do we stop SSH keys? We have a couple places we can just, you know, remove authorized keys. And that's not a terrible idea. Um, but if Red Team gets back in, they can re-add them. Uh, Red Team can also change the directory that those are located in, in this configuration file right here, the authorized keys file. If they modify that line, they can put their keys wherever they want. They don't have to necessarily be in that particular location. So um, the easiest thing to do, if I can you know, find the line, that's always good. It's just pub. Yeah, am I just, is it a capital P? It is. No. No keys. We don't like keys. Keys are bad. In CCDC, other and outside of CCDC, please use them. They're great. They're awesome. Use them. But for this, not a good thing. So that was the main stuff in this box. Uh, you guys change password ports. You throw up you throw up IP tables. Change passwords. Um, out of the sudoers file, although that doesn't necessarily matter if they can't get in. But definitely, you know, mess with that and look and see that. Oh yeah, okay, that's it. We have two extra people in here, which isn't too bad. All I'm doing there, I'm grabbing the group, environmental variable, grabbing sudo, and you notice here there was a lot of people in sudo. So a lot of people on this box could have used sudo to escalate to root. A lot of people. Just checking here. Nope, okay. Brian's been slow. That. No, nope. Uh, something to note in competitions, and this is, so for the purpose of this competition, I don't know. They'll, they'll tell you if someone needs sudo. Always, you can always assume they don't need admin privileges and unless they tell you. If you get a sheet that says admin, pri admin people, otherwise, yeah. n nobody. If um, you're sure, you can ask white team. You can ask white team, that's always a good decision. But I would honestly go through here and I would take everybody out of the sudos group, period. I would probably go back in and just leave root and DSU in there. Uh, the reason I'll leave DSU in there is because Ubuntu is weird and won't let you log in as root sometimes. Okay. Um, so you can inadvertently end up locking yourself out. Uh, for this particular box, I don't think there was too much more to mess with. Throw up firewalls that would have blocked the back door, change passwords, sudoers. Um, not, not too much going on here. I'm gonna switch over to dev. And just to show you, that was, this is the checklist in there. This is the basic stuff. Um, a lot of anonymous disable, which is important, not for this competition because I didn't allow anonymous users when I made that box. Um, other stuff, we're setting here the, the masks, so we're basically, actually, yeah, that, yeah, read, read. Um, although what those masks mean is that when people make files, those are what bits get set. So when people, when, when every, whenever an anonymous user puts in a file, it's read only. Whenever, uh, <coughs> A local user puts in that it's read, write, read, read. Any questions on that particular subject? A little complicated permission bits, no? 
would have been these two lines right here, as, as said, would have got you your passive data points, parts. And that's what we went over, uh, which is probably part of the reason why. Oh, joy. No, terminal size, please. Yeah, you guys didn't know Linux Box had a GUI? It's OK, because uh, one day you'll figure out GUIs are terrible, and you should never use them. Uh, this is why. This is why GUIs are terrible. Because it's slow. It's loading. OK. Ironically, the second I put my hand up, it you know actually loaded. Normally, I'd switch to the virtual terminal. But if I do that, it's going to switch my Linux desktop as well. OK. Because Ubuntu doesn't let us log in as root, we've got to escalate first. OK, we have this box now. Um, this box only scored servers with SSH. Whenever you see that, you know that's the box you want to be on, because that's going to be the easy one. Um, in, in, in general, SSH is a secure service. Uh, there's, there's, there's definitely vulnerabilities for it. You might have to upgrade. But if you have to do that, you have a very secure SSH. SSH is just not, in general, something that can be exploited quite as much. I mean, there's, there's still versions out there that are vulnerable, but it's in general, it's better. Um, hmm? Yeah, you don't, want, you don't want Telnet for sure, another bad one. Uh, the special thing about this box, which I'm going to be asked, I don't know how much Red Team even had fun with, was this little beauty right here. VNC. Anybody know what VNC is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's RDP. It's pretty much RDP. Kind of the same idea. Uh, what that means is they can pull up your screen and watch you and mess around with you. I don't know, did, anybody, did that actually happen in the competition at all? Did anybody have a foreign mouse come in and try to like steal your life? No? Red Team doesn't, didn't like it, probably, because it was too much effort. Um, they would have had to you know, message your mouse and try to steal your, just wasn't worth it. Uh, not where they can SSH in and just do everything else they did. So kind of the same thing here. If It's SSH, not a vulnerable service. Um, so to secure that portion, change passwords. Not too much else needs to be done there. Uh, at that point, Red Team might, also, might already have a shell. OK, someone is, I'm, I'm assuming Brian actually, nope. Oh, that's me. Dang it. See, I was disappointed because you know I thought Brian was going to log into my stuff and mess with me. but. That's the GUI. That's me. Uh, PTS is, is your pseudo terminals versus TTY is your hardware terminals. So uh, I was I got confused there for a second. But whatever. We have X11. Uh, we can kill that service. Actually, I'm not sure if this is going to stop it or not. I'm going to tell you in advance. Oh, it did. Okay. Okay. That's all it took to stop to top, to stop VNZ. That's it. That line right there. Um, if you guys threw up a firewall on this one. Would have done it as well, as long as you only allowed 22 inbound. Throwing up a firewall, only allowing 22, changing passwords. All that required to keep this box pretty much 100% secure. Um, the exception um, on this box in particular is because we have SSH. If Red Team is already connected at this point, their shells are not going to go away. There's no way to get uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're stuck there forever. There's nothing we can do. We turn off the box, but they're still there. No, we, we, can, we can kill them. Um, uh, I mean, probably the cheesiest way. I don't know. You could probably restart the service. That should, that should wipe them. But uh, we have options. I mean, for example, who there will tell you if someone's using a terminal? Uh, you, can, you can cycle the service. That should do it. I don't know, Nick. Is that correct? Power cycling? It, so it, has it, is there, have you ever had it where it hasn't killed all the shells if you power cycle the service? I think if you stop. And then start. If you restart, I think it might hold on to the session. I, I think there might be an issue with the timeout, yeah, is what it is. Uh, power cycling will probably take care of it, so stopping, stop it using services and then starting back up again. Uh, you can kill their shells with, you find who they are with who. PSOX, grep for, okay. That. You can run PS space T as well. That? Yeah. What is it pulling up there? I think you have to give it a username too. Specifically. Well, that's that might not be super helpful. Unfortunately, there's kind of a. Oh, 
Not like that, though, apparently. It'd be that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Nope. Okay. No idea how that one works. Next time he lies. No. Point is, we can, we can kill their shells. Um, however you manage to do that doesn't really matter as long as you manage to kill their shells. Same thing as before. SSH keys. Uh, probably the, the only thing I forgot was that apparently they like to mess with your cron tabs. Anybody know what those are? I heard a yeah or something. Somebody want to explain what they are? Schedule tasks. So uh, we have task scheduler, except ours is nicer. Um, down here, if I were to punch in, it's, it's, I'm not really going to try to explain the inter interface. But all you need to know is that you know if you have something like that is what the line you want to delete. Uh, basically, when we're doing cron tabs, uh, it says MH, whatever. So it's minutes, hours, days of the month, whatever else, whatever else I forgot. Point is, that, runs, that would run every minute because it's, it, cron tabs run a maximum of one minute, so it's going to run once every minute if I put all stars there. Uh, there's some other stuff you can do to, to modify the times. Uh, you might have legitimate stuff in here as well. Uh, and keep that in mind at all times when doing DefSec is that, you know, other people might be using that besides Red Team. Like, Linux doesn't, like, just make stuff just for Red Team. We don't, we don't manufacture, like, you know, I think Red Team would really love this for um, the mock competition. Let's push it to the kernel. We're not pushing it. Push it to the repos. Um, this, is, this box, pretty much, once again, all you need to deal with it. All, all you need to do. Um, the other boxes were a little bit less fun. You can tell because they have web browsers, sorry, they have web servers, which just provide for more GUIs. Okay, unless Nick wants to tell me to show anything else, I'm probably just gonna move on to these. Okay, oh, yeah, I forgot, I need a GUI. Yay. Okay. So, in addition to that, we have two web servers. Uh, they're both web servers. They're both running port 80. I think both, both of them had port 80 scored, yeah. Um, nothing too special about them. One was running Magento. One was running WordPress. Okay, this is what I was afraid of. Oh, no. Oh, it does reject properly. Why is my DNS broken? Yeah, I'm going to be asked here. I don't know why you'd be having those problems. My assumption would be because, so your DNS was hosted on your DC. If there was anything wrong with your DC, uh, you're not getting DNS. Gotcha. The assumption I would have, my, immediately, my immediate assumption would be your domain admin fired off, firewalled off DNS. And I, unless you have any other guesses, Nick, that'd be my, the most likely assumption I would have for that one. Yeah. Either that or you blocked out the yeah, or you know, you firewall it, it's your fault. So, so two pages. First one's a WordPress. Uh, we didn't go over this, but you know, log into web pages. Oh, it wants me to install Gutenberg. Okay. Probably, f for the most part, what would have really helped you guys is, you know, can I edit my profile, please? Oh, is this my profile? Oh, this is my profile. I haven't looked at this before, by the way. Is it up there? Did I miss it? I can set a first name and a last name. Where's the one thing I want to do? There we go. Oh, that's pretty terrible. You didn't change it after you generated it. Serious? Yeah. <coughs> who does this? WordPress is for people who don't know how to use computers. Well, that's why it has a GUI. Can I, can, I, can I keep that? Yes, confirm use. <laughs> Brian, you're not allowed to use that one. <laughs> you're not allowed. It's secure. It's not password one bang, right? Okay. Um, what else did we have going on in this one? We had, we had the super secure robots.txt page. Uh, gosh. You know, S's are nice. We use them to make things plural. What is the purpose of the robots.txt page? People? It's basically for like web uh, scrapers to tell them what they can and can't scrape. 
Yeah, so we have websites have the equivalent of a please don't hack us page. And that's basically what this is. This is telling web, web scrapers, web spiders, uh, not to go to those pages. Which from their perspective, they're talking about things like search engine, from search engine like Google. They don't want Google indexing, you know, your whatever page is basically what the idea of this is. Uh, not the greatest idea if you use them because you think you're like, they can't access that directory anymore. <coughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna, oh, how, is that how we set it up? I think we screwed that up. Yeah, yeah, so this, this is an ineffectual. <laughs> See, uh, the funny thing about this is, you know, I made three out of four of the boxes. Jared made the other one, so I can just blame him for everything on this one. Um, indexing was also turned on, which means, you know, we can see the entire index if you go to the directory. Here was the bad place. Like, th this, this is what, besides, you know, the default password and the login, this was the other thing we did to WordPress. Uh, anybody know what, you know, a WordPress config file normally contains? So th this, this is the settings. But here's the important stuff. We were using a MySQL database to run this. So my, it's a database, it stores your data, uh, it's where we store pages and all that sort of thing. The WordPress config file needs a password to connect to the database. Yeah, once again, Jared made this box, not my fault. Uh, but, but, but there you go, there's your password. So what, what that means is that they could use MySQL to connect to your server. <laughs> See, I, I also don't disable Slack notifications. He just used root, right? Yeah. Whatever. Is it gonna let me in? Oh no, I don't have my SQL. Well, that's that's unfortunate. I don't have the client. We have the server running. Uh, what what that means is that Red Team could connect to your MySQL database and drop all your tables, rendering your WordPress application, you know, unfunctional. How it should be, but oh well. Uh, what you could have done to prevent this would have just been delete this page. It's, ironically, it is. <laughs> that, that's, that's the directory on your server would have been var HTML backup. If you just would have cleared out that file, there's really no way, no reason to have that file there or, you know, move it if you're unsure. But get rid of that file. Once they have access to your MySQL server, I don't know. You, you, Red, team, Red team can't really do anything to, like, pop reverse shells in that server. They just have it. Um, what you should have done initially that would have provided this whole entire thing from being kind of moot is if you did a firewall, they wouldn't have been able to access your MySQL remotely at all. So they can't get into MySQL, they can't mess with your stuff, they can only access port 80. Uh, they could log into your web page, change the password, not too much else for them to do there. So any questions in that box? Questions about what SQL is and why we love it so much? Can you cover PHP on that one? Or? Oh, uh, I was going to cut PHP on the other one, wasn't I? Well, I still need a GUI. Yeah. If that's what you meant. Yeah. That one wasn't vulnerable, though, to SQL injection, as far as I'm aware, unless Nick lied to me. <sighs> one day. One day, connecting blood. Okay, we also Magento. E commerce site. Also using a MySQL server. Um, the funny thing about this one, and I better start typing stuff in before it, was that was viral SQL injection. What does, what's SQL injection? Someone want to explain that? I'm, I know everyone, not everyone, but I, I know a couple people here definitely know what SQL injection is. So what is, how is that a vulnerability? What does that mean for websites? If there is SQL injection, or you can do SQL injection on that site. And basically what it boils down to is... You're feeding a server malformed data. Yeah. So when we're, when we're, when we're tossing data, data to the server, that's kind of the assumption that's being processed and uh, being converted into strings and being parsed properly so that when we do something, when we toss it symbols, um, they're, they're, they're counted as strings and they're not counted as whatever, is the, whatever, whatever code in the underlying framework. So if we, put, if we put a comma in here, it's being counted as like a string comma, which it might be encoded, or they might do something else to make sure that that comes out as a, as a string versus as an escape sequence. So you can't escape out of whatever string it is and then run arbitrary codes. 
Um, so, I mean, I don't know. The most famous one would probably be like what? Oh. I don't think this page was vulnerable. Was it page? Yeah. No. There was a different page on the website. Kind of an example. If they did that and then they typed in like, I don't know, something else. Uh, you know, if I could type, that'd be helpful. Good example? No? Wouldn't work? No. Okay. It'll, viewer 1 equals 1 would just let you log in. Oh, you're right. So, I forgot. It would have been whatever else you could have, no, you could have done without that. Point is, you can execute arbitrary commands. That's not a good thing. You gotta fix that. You're right. I forgot how SQL injection worked. I don't know why they're so slow. Yeah, so this is the message you would have got if you logged into the admin page. Did anybody actually log into the admin page? If you're on blue team, I'm not counting red teamers. So, raise your hand if you logged into the Magento admin page, or you know, either admin page as blue team. Okay, that's a problem. Um, no matter what, I would still, you know, it, it, it doesn't need to be the first thing you do, but you know, get around to it. Because the message is like this, like, hey, we have security issues. You should look at that. Yay. Actually, does it actually tell me how to upgrade? I don't remember. Here, Magento. Oh, yeah. Zooming really is helping me with those buyers there. We would have had to do a full upgrade on Magento, I suppose, to stop this when we have. I think there's a patch just like 1.9.1. There is, isn't there? But it's not. You can't get it. You can't install it internally. You can. I'm not sure how to do it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, some Googling. Probably not going to do that right now, but you guys could have figured out how to upgrade Magento. Um, I don't know. Doing a full reinstall. We, we had nothing on the default page, right? Not really. Yeah, you could have gotten probably, you might have been able to get away with like completely wiping Magento and reinstalling it, and that actually might have worked as far as I'm aware with the scoring engine. Um, I don't know if we would have accepted that or not. Maybe. Uh, but that's the idea. You would have had to up upgrade to Magento to get rid of that vulnerability. Um, the funny thing is, I don't think Red Team actually used that. Did Red Team do SQL injection or anything, Brian? Do you know? Uh, not injection, no. no. So it was there. They didn't use it. Uh, you, so in reality, you wouldn't have had to do anything. Uh, for, for this particular mock competition, uh, they might have. And, and probably the reason they didn't use it is because there was so many other easier ways to get into your boxes besides that. So, you know, work, work your way up to it. Uh, same thing would have worked if we're not counting that. Uh, I just want a terminal, but I actually don't want a terminal. So for that particular box, I think it would have been pretty much the same process as the other ones. Change passwords, throw up firewalls. The only thing accessible at that point would be 80. And the only way to get in for 80 is either the, the password, so change passwords on that particular interface. Um, and then they could have done SQL injection, but they did. They didn't the competition. I don't know if you guys actually managed to perfect, perfectly secure everything, whether they would have gotten around to trying that. So they probably still would have. I would have thought. Think eventually, but not probably the t the, the biggest concern. Um, I don't know, Brian. Are you any box on any boxes? No. Okay. Nick, anything else you want me to cover, Nick? PHP. Oh, gosh, you keep reminding me of that. I keep forgetting. And I logged in the wrong box. I'm really. <laughs> they look right. And ironically, all those boxes. Okay. Um, something else Red Team can do once they get admin access, uh, or depending on if your site's vulnerable some up to some of their issues, they can upload a PHP shell. What's a PHP shell? Or anybody know the concept behind a PHP show? Any guesses? Something. OK. Um, essentially, what the idea of a PHP show is they, they can upload a file. And because of misconfigurations, we're just going to like you know execute that file as PHP versus as HTML and JavaScript and everything else. We're actually going to execute that as PHP, which we run server side. So they can, it, it's basically another remote command execution bug. Now, excuse me here, I actually don't remember where I'm going. 
Actually, it should be P it should be Apache two. Yeah. Okay. PHP to INI and Etsy Apache five Apache two. Uh, the path will vary. Stop it. I'm done with you. Okay. Configuration files. Things we get to edit. Fun stuff. So, a lot of junk in here. I actually don't. It's probably into the top section. But let's just look at this quick here. Um, something to note is that. You know, we've, we've been doing DevSec for a while, and we've made lots of lists for ourselves that you can feel, you know, use them, please. We made them for a reason. Uh, they wouldn't be nearly so pretty if only we intended to use them, you know, the people who wrote them. Uh, Nick wrote this one, has a lot of general stuff. Some of these are nice. This is the line we really care about, this line right here, the disable functions line. It's gonna, mm, I don't remember. Uh, what the disable function line actually does is basically lists out a set of PHP functions which we are de we are disabling. We are saying you cannot run these functions. Shell, shell exec, exec, pass through, proc open, p open, system, and PHP info. Besides PHP info, as far as I'm aware, all of those are different ways to essentially execute commands on the system itself as the PHP user account. What that means is they can traverse from having access to, you know, an Apache server, to getting, a ba not not really. I, I guess it is. Uh, it's it's not quite a bash shell, but it's pretty close. And they actually, yeah, they can get a bash shell with that, which means now there's a shell in your web browser running as the web browser user, which is normally www dash data. Uh, if you were to punch this line in the PHP file, which it should just be a domain, right? Oh, yeah. See, I would have printed this off and then I wouldn't have had to do this, but you know, the printers decided they didn't want to work today, so thank you, Easthall. Uh, is that line actually in here? Do you know? Pretty sure it is. Oh, it is in here. It doesn't have the stuff we want in it, though. Yeah. Ironically, what, what, what are we actually, have you looked at this? What are we actually disabling besides that? Like by default, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, you mean like other stuff we don't want to have happen? <sighs> Thank you, Terminal, for being too big. Okay. PHP info just basically displays a lot of PHP information. I think it just basically spits up the HTML to make a nice info page. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, makes out a nice info page for you to look at. Like, and it'll tell them all sorts of nice things like your PHP version and modules you have enabled and other stuff Red Team likes to use. So after you've made those changes to that file, you can just do Apache 2 restart. And it'll whine that the domain name is wrong and restart. So, uh, so, so as I said for that box, doing PHP hardening would have prevented a lot of the PHP shells. Um, ideally, that doesn't necessarily matter if you can beat them to the admin page. But I'm going to be honest, you're probably not going to have beaten them to the admin page if you set up firewalls and did user and everything else before you went to look at the page. So probably something you would have wanted to do. Uh, that would have prevented their, you know, their one-liner plug-in to go call back. Anything I've missed? Anything else we want to talk about? Any questions? Yeah? Want my computer? Yeah. Sure. SSH. Uh, is this, shop? Yeah. Is this Debian based? Yeah. yeah. Ubuntu right. is Debian based and the rest is Debian, so yeah. Uh, I wanted to give them Solaris for this first competition, but they couldn't let me. Thank so, you. in your uh, SSH directory here, you have sshd underscore config. And um, I'm not going to pretend I'm a Linux like expert at all compared to some other people in the room. And I don't know all the things that go on in there. So if you just really want to, you can just move sshd config to dot old. And now it's gone. And now the service doesn't actually work anymore. We can fix that with one command. dpkg-reconfigure. Open SSH server. So what this does 
is it goes through the initial setup process uh, when you first install OpenSSH, and it will actually regenerate you a, a good default SSHD config file. Let's see if that worked. I might have to stop it. Nope. So now that uh, SSHD config is uh, the default blank uh, and should be by default secure. And uh, after you've added your firewall rules, changed everyone's passwords, um, probably just a good idea to run that because, you know, <laughs> whatever changes we made to it are then null and void. Uh, the only so, thing, I would still probably go in there to say oh, pub key authentication. Yeah, that's probably that, good. But, uh, no, that's quick and dirty. Uh, that'll also work for about any other service that you think they've tampered with. Um, there might be one or two cases where that won't work if they've cleared out the package cache. That's not likely to happen, so that should work probably about 100% of the time unless, you know, white team intentionally wanted to screw you over. So, uh, Any questions on anything I went over here today? Anything at all? Anything Linux based? No? Okay. okay I'm going to disconnect. Anyone missing a pocket knife? All right, so let's talk Wandos. Um, <coughs> it's not too bad. Um, big things, again, change passwords and firewalls. Those are the main things. But we'll talk about a few other things that you guys could have done. So let's just start with the DC. Let's assume that we've changed the passwords and everything like that, because that's all good and fun. Uh, one of the things that came out a little over a year and a half ago was a fun little exploit program called Eternal Blue and a bunch of other Eternal programs. So you can actually <clears throat> secure your systems more by disabling SMB entirely, but you might not want to do that, especially if you need your domain for anything, because domains work with SMB a lot. Uh, so if you do need your domain, I actually just added this to the Windows checklist because I didn't realize it wasn't in there, um, is just disable SMB version 1. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in on that. Ooh. So if you have uh, <coughs> PowerShell version 2 or newer, this is the command you have to run. Uh, it's kind of a mess, but it's basically just changing a registry key that says we're not going to use SMB version 1 anymore. <clears throat> so a little bit of technical details about the exploit. It uh, is a vulnerability in SMB version 1, actually. Um, so this will actually just turn SMB version 1 off. I believe you still need to do a restart or stop the service in order, or restart the service in order for it to actually take effect. So you'd have to go and restart your machine. So that's one thing you guys could have done. Also on the domain controller, um, zoom out a little bit now. Oops. Uh, there was a couple, well, there was one main group policy thing that you guys should have changed. I know we haven't really talked about it a whole lot, but, um, oh shoot, come on. I'm not sure if Red Team even realized that this was a thing, but if you go to the default domain policy right here in group policy editor, click edit. And if you go to policies, Windows settings, I believe. 
security settings, and account policies, and then the password policy. Uh, the uh, default password policy that you guys were given was not very good. So minimum password length, seven characters, you could up that. Um, you could only store a certain amount of characters if you were in like a real business, or a certain amount of passwords if you're in a real business so that users couldn't reuse passwords, right? Um, but this setting right here, password, store passwords using reversible encryption, that's enabled. That's, that's a no-no. You want to make sure that that's disabled, right? Come on. So I'm just going to do that. Okay. So that was one of the bad settings here. Another thing, um, Jacob has done a wonderful thing for me. He's hacked this domain controller and has a shell with persistence. So we're going to go ahead and try and get rid of that. So the first thing you should do if you think you've been compromised is check netstat. So I'm just going to scroll up to that command. And so what I'm looking for um, is an established connection, meaning it's an active connection. So I'm going to enter netstat dash a n o b pipe it to find string and then the word established. And right here at the top, I can see that I have a TCP connection to uh, 10.0.1.100 on port 4444, which I know to be the default port that Meterpreter uses which is what a lot of the shells that Red Team had on you guys were. So I know that I want to kill that. And I can see that it's running on process 2212. So I'm going to do a little bit more investigation before I actually kill that. <clears throat> I'm going to check if he set up any persistence. So the persistence is what he would use to get back in if I kill his shell or if I restart my computer, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go open up the file explorer here, go to computer, the C drive, Windows, and then I know that uh, by default, Meterpreter's persistent script puts things in this temp folder here in C Windows. So it's C Windows temp, and sure enough, there's a little VB script right here. Um, oof. All right, V Y E Y Q K, random stuff. If you were to open that, it's just like a base64 encoded string of mess that you wouldn't really understand. But that's actually the script he's using to uh, be persistent. So I'm just going to delete that. And then I'm going to open up Task Manager. And I'm going to go to make sure I'm on the Processes tab. And so I have the Process ID, but by default, Task Manager doesn't actually show Process IDs. So if you just go to View here, and then select columns, and then make sure the process ID uh, box is selected. Click OK. Looks like I think he has a couple of shells on me now, or Brian does, or someone. So the one in particular was 2212. So I'm just going to sort this. So 2212 is powershell.exe. Uh, and we're just going to kill that. Did you lose your shell? No. Okay. So we're going to do this again. And there doesn't appear to be anything else um, calling out unless it's doing it over. IPv6. So now we've removed the shell and its persistence. And if, I believe you got in with uh, PS exec, right? So if I were to change my password before killing him, kicking him out, and he didn't have the password, he wouldn't be able to use that to get back in without finding out what my password was. Um, so now the DC is essentially secured. I haven't fully done it because I haven't actually changed the passwords or anything like that. 
or looked at the firewall rules, but those are all things we've covered. <clears throat> so that was the DC. Let's go on to the share. What? I just want to say that it's a great strategy to after you find red team on your box before killing them and making us aware that you have found us to investigate fully how we got in and then patch that. So if you suspect I got into um, default credits, change the credits and then kick us out. Because the first thing we're going to do is try to get back in. Also write up your incident response report while you still have the evidence of them being there. Okay, so uh, the share um, was an SMB share, so it was just sharing the files, obviously, right? So uh, again, you'd want to do that disabling SMB version 1. I believe that would still work with the scoring engine, right? Yes. Okay, so if you just disable that, that'll make it a little bit safer against things like Eternal Blue. Um, and for the most part, this share box wasn't super vulnerable, except for, again, default credentials, eternal blue, stuff like that. Uh, the issue, the main issue was this, was permissions. So um, the share folder is right here, is doit.corp. So you go to properties and sharing, advanced sharing. That's not the one I wanted. Hmm. I was working 10 minutes ago. Properties, advanced sharing. Okay. There's a permissions button there. Oh, there it is. Okay. So right now, this entire folder is shareable to everyone with full control so they can change, read, everything, right? That's probably not a good idea. So what you'd want to go in and do is uh, change this and add authenticated users and hit check names and then remove everyone. So now only people that are actually authenticated to the domain can <coughs> access this share drive, right? And then it's up to you whether or not you want to allow them full control or anything like that. I believe the scoring engine was just reading, right? So in this case, just reading would have been fine. I'm just going to... It depends on how the scoring engine is um, set up. Uh, I think for most part, we usually just have it reading. Uh, however, you can go in and like check the uh, event viewer and see what they're trying to do, if they're getting errors or something like that, if you're not getting points, which will be a conversation for another day because event viewer is quite the beast. And then uh, were you having just each user account try to get to their own folder, or what were you doing? Okay. They go on their own folder and find the file there. Okay, so another thing you could always do too is check each individual folder within this share folder and check the permissions on that. Oh, this one isn't actually shared. So, again, you'd want to be like, this is Ann.Atkins folder. <laughs> check the names, click OK. Give her full control, click apply, and remove everyone. Go under the security tab. Oh, th there's a bunch of other ones in here too. And so here you can actually see what permissions each of these groups have. So everyone has access there, so you can remove. So this is actually the permissions, not just who you're sharing it to. Um, so you'd want to just go in and remove these two. You can't remove everyone inheriting objects from its parents. Security, it move, there. So you'd want to limit this. Um, depending on your... Uh, Set up, you might want uh, administrators to be able to access all the share folders. You might not. Um, probably don't want 
users unless it's the whole share folder. But these are just the local users of this server. So that's kind of what you could have done there. And then, of course, again, make sure all the user accounts are good, make sure the passwords are changed, firewall rules. <clears throat> so I didn't really touch the CEO workstation at all, but it's the CEO workstation, and it had RB RDP as a scored service. Maybe it'll sign in. The basic idea here is we're only going to be doing RDP, and it's only going to be the CEO. So it's going to be Rachel.Slavin as the user account that we allow that if it signs in. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so to do that, we can just go to Start, Control Panel, Users. I misspelled that. Select users who can remote desktop is the specific thing we're going to be doing. And select users right here. So right in here, it said anyone could remote desktop. We don't want that. So we're just going to remove everyone and click Add. And then Rachel. Dot slaven. Click OK. OK. And OK. So now another thing we do is we just go back into, um, not that one. Let's just do computer management. So you go to local users and groups over here on the left and go to groups. And then check the remote desktop users groups, just again to make sure that Rachel Slavin is the only one who can remote desktop. And then you'd also want to check the administrators group um, because sh you might not want her to um, be an administrator, right? And so there's a couple other administrators in here too that you can probably remove. It's always a good idea to ask white team if they're meant to be administrators or if you can remove them. Hmm. Which one was the built-in account? Oh. Oh, did they rename administrator to CEO Rachel? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so you might want to rename that back to administrator. <coughs> and then not let the CEO log into that account. It's probably a bad idea. So yeah, that's pretty much what you would do there. Um, this one wasn't connected at the domain. It was an inject to connect it to the domain, though. So what you could have done until you got that inject is to turn off SMB completely. Uh, and then it'd be pretty safe from Eternal Blue and stuff like that. You could also firewall it off. And last but not least, the HRM box. How many people actually logged into the web application on this box. Yeah? Did you change the password? Yeah. Okay, good. So it's a good, uh, oh, this is also a good discussion right now too. Uh, I'm not sure how many teams did this, but on some of these servers, when you first log in, some of you might log into the local administrator account, which you should also change the password or disable if it's connected to the domain. However, sometimes you might be logging into the domain administrator account. They're both called administrator. And so what happens to some teams is everyone will try changing the domain admin password at the same time to a different one, potentially. And that can be bad 
because if you're all signed in as a domain admin and changing it, the last person who changed it, their password's going to be the one that's going to be set to you, and then you're going to have to deconflict on all that fun stuff. So just beware of what account you're signing into. Um, usually, when you're signing into the domain ad one, admin one, it'll have uh, do it in front of it, or the domain name. Oh my goodness, I cannot type. There we go. So, all right. I'll just log me in quick. Nice black screen. Gotta need gotta use that media player. Fantastic. There we go. However, I may have just realized a flaw in my plan because I think Orange HRM was only assigned uh, installed for the local administrator account. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, let's just log out of this quick. Uh, so if you ever get to this login prompt and you're not sure which one you're logging into, if, it, if you see it saying the domain name, to get to the local machine, you just type dot and then backslash and then the username. All right, there we go. So the orange HRM just has a little shortcut there to the website. I couldn't remember the URL, so. <clears throat> Ask me later. All right, so this is basically a common thing you'll have in these competitions because it's a, a human resources management engine that you can get for free. Um, so it's easy to set up. So you, I think the username and password were admin and password one bang. So whenever you guys have a web server, you should definitely check out what website you're serving. If you're not doing that, that's probably a bad idea to not just ignore it and keep restarting it because there are definitely things in here that uh, Red Team can get in and access. Uh, for example, if you go to the employee list after logging in with just the default password, you can click on an employee. Let's click on the CEO just for fun. And Red Team can just go in here and like get the social security number, date of birth, um, I believe I put like bank account information in here too somewhere. 
So this is where like a lot of your PII stuff is stored. So you'd want to go in and make sure that you change the passwords um, for this service so that Red Team can't get in there and take that data, right? So literally with Orange HRM, it's just as easy as signing in, clicking on the admin up here, and then clicking this edit button. I don't know why they do this for everything that you change. You have to click the edit button before you can type in the boxes. But then you can go in and change the password and all that good stuff. Um, I don't know if this version of Orange HRM actually had any security vulnerabilities with it or not. I didn't bother looking. Um, I didn't figure a red team was going to take the time to actually exploit that when they could just log in, but you never know. Oh, yeah. That's always fun. And then, of course, just the basics like passwords, firewall rules, stuff like that. Um, you'd also want to look into that XAMP thing. There weren't any public vulnerabilities of actually exploiting it in a useful way. It's just writing to that one file. It just writes the tag. Okay. So the XAMP directory is actually just C XAMP. Um, do you remember which file it was? Lang dot TMP. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that actually could potentially be dangerous because you could write like an entire PHP file in there and like get a PHP shell on the box. So we tried. Yeah, we it wasn't working too well for you. It might be because you can't change the extension. Well, you could URL encode it, right? Yeah. Fill up the hard drive. <laughs> Fill up the hard drive. Make the box unusable. <laughs> cool. So with that, uh, are there any questions on the Windows side of things? Anything I didn't cover? Anything your burning questions you guys have? Has anyone been saying anything in the chat on the live stream, Cody? Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So, I guess, does anyone else that was presenting tonight or any of you guys have anything else to add? Yeah, there's one. We forgot to talk a little bit about PII on Linux. Okay. Show one quickly. And a preview of the next mock competition. Uh, I have something else to show too. So. so this is on the Magento system. There were under sales and orders, there were like five or six transactions that had taken place in the past. And we have credit card information in here, which was part of the PII that we had Red Team going after. Um, I believe they only managed to dump the database from the Magento system on one team. I think it was team three. And they only got encrypted data out of that. So by default, Magento will encrypt. Actually, I don't know if it's default. You might have to check a box on an installation. It'll encrypt all your credit card info. Um, but that encrypt, I think they managed to grab the file that had the key to the, the encryption as well. They didn't manage to actually decrypt it, though. Um, so that is one thing to worry about. Um, 
And then on the R&D box, we had tapsecret.tar.gz.gpg that had a bunch of CAD files of like corn and tanks and things like that. Um, that was another thing they were going after. Um, but other than that, let's jump back over here. Oh, you want to do something? Cool. Thank you. How do I do that? Ooh. This is like my second week. So I want to show you guys a couple, uh, couple things that we did at the very beginning. Um, so at the beginning, this is basically what my setup looked like. I have Metasploit open in one terminal. In another terminal, I have another program called CrackMapExec. And Metasploit is already has this job set up to catch any shells I give it um, from CrackMapExec. Uh, to my system. So I already have this job set up, it's ready to go, Metasploit's ready to catch some shells, and I already have this command written out that says uh, enumerate all SMB um, ports that are open on the 1.0 network, uh, use the username administrator, pass through pass one bang, uh, use the module meta, um, metas or meterpreter inject, which will inject meterpreter in through a uh, SMB into the um, systems, uh, give that shell back to my computer, and use local authentication instead of domain authentication. So when they, when white team says go to us, I push one button, and I enumerated, I pwned all your systems. Except for the DC. Except for the DC. So, yeah. And if we're going to watch over here in Metasploit, and we all cross our fingers and Metasploit works tonight. Uh, you'll see my shells just bring down in Metasploit. It'll be pretty cool, hopefully. So there's Metropor session number one. And we should get three of them, maybe? No, two. I'll get two. So it's not the fastest, but it does work. So while you guys are all busy changing your passwords in like, second zero, I already have a shell. And there's a lot of other fancy stuff we do after this. You know, we hide our processes and we pr uh, insert our persistence and all that fun stuff like Dylan just showed you how to get rid of. Um, and yeah. And then once this is finished, I hope, hopefully it does the other one too. Or maybe not, I'll just kill it. Yeah, I know you're waiting. And then I haven't figured out, I haven't uh, messed with it to do it both, but then I just changed this from local auth because that means that you have to change, that's the local administrator password. Now I'm just gonna use the domain one. And again, I pwned everything. So I can't run those at the same time, but I haven't figured out which one I want to run. I'm trying to combine them both so it does them both at the same time. But um, yeah, more shells. So at this stage, right, I've owned all your Windows boxes, and now I just have to stay in there. And standardize his job to kick me out. So it's hard for you guys to stop us from getting in. It really is. 
but the goal should be for you guys to kick us out and keep us out. So I used this exact trick on Sunday, and I had access to everyone's share in DC. By, by dinner time, when the pizza came, uh, all but two teams kicked me out. I didn't launch anymore. I didn't do this again and again and again. I could have. Um, but after two hours in, four to six teams had kicked me out completely from their Windows boxes. So uh, there was some trouble with those boxes um, with my automation that didn't work exactly correctly. But um, yeah, I had enough shells that I didn't really need to worry about those systems. Uh, and I could also pivot from there. So yeah, I have shells. And then after the, after the pizza came, uh, I used other methods to get back into those teams again. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> so behold, all my sessions. Oh, that didn't work. So yeah, even though it shows the administrator, since I'm administrator, I can easily get system. I can just upgrade my shell really fast, and I'm system on everybody. So kick us out. We're going to get in. Thank you. So next mock is October 21st. Um, things to look forward to, a network firewall. You're going to get a PFSense box next time. We're going to stick in some Red Hat systems, so CentOS and Fedora. Um, we're going to add databases. That's MS SQL and MySQL. And you're going to have more systems to deal with, uh, up in 8 to 12 instead of 8. So you're going to have to work on your multitasking skills for the next one. Um, all this stuff we're going to cover in the next two or three weeks, um, so you'll be pretty well prepared for that. Well, and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>